tonight I want to talk about improve our soils and improve our soil health. And I think when you see a picture like this, which is on my wife and I's property, kind of a nice feeling, uh, you know, healthy, wholesome, good. I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, how did this happen and what's going on? And first I'll mention that I really appreciate y'all because I'm 32 years out of a kidney transplant. I've seen some people with Rochester, Minnesota badges, Mayo. I, I do my health care at the Mayo, so I really appreciate that very much. And I went through a period of weak bones, Fossil Max, some of y'all probably remember that, took a little too much of that, and come back around. My bones are really good now. I'm actually slightly above normal for a 63-year-old, so hopefully I don't have to visit y'all anytime soon. And, and I've been told this a lot with nutritionists at the Mayo Clinic. Hey, man, you need a lot of calcium, especially the transplant patient, and here's some products that or, or, you know, produce, whatever you need to consume to get more calcium. Well, calcium is important to everything. Plants really need a lot of calcium. A lot of critters need calcium. Think of eggs. Pollinators need a lot of calcium. Think of a little bitty pollinator traveling so far. And the weight they carry per their weight is just, you know, more than any human could think about doing. So calcium's just one, but the bad news is if you look at 1975, and this is you know, data from USDA that worked with several universities, uh, gosh, calcium percentage has dropped, oh gosh, down 53%, you can go on down the list. Well, that's because of a decline in soil health. And that's what I wanna share with you tonight because just like so many things, if we go back to how it was meant to be or how it was, if we study some of these undisturbed soils, and they're very limited in the U.S., I'm talking a few acres, just a few acres of native prairie or native timber left, just a few acres, some states have none, we can learn a lot about how plants interacted with soil before synthetic inputs. And I'll mention here briefly that we got nitrogen. Everyone's heard about nitrogen man in school. It was N, P, and K. I had all these inorganic and organic chemistry classes and how do plants interact with this and we can add these artificial quote unquote supplements to increase yield, which is true. But we got nitrogen because there's a very famous scientist that escaped Germany during World War II. He was working on a bomb to defeat the US and part of his research led him how to make nitrogen relatively inexpensively. And it worked and plants responded, but what he did not think about is how that actually caused a lot of damage to soil. And still today, we see farmers putting out ammonia, hydroxide, and other things. That's a form of nitrogen. And what that's really doing to the soil. And I'm not anti-farming. I was actually raised on a farm. We all can learn and do better. So this is pretty scary. They're actually oranges now that have no vitamin C in them. And that's strictly due, I mean, that's hard to believe, isn't it? That kind of, I probably lost a lot of credibility with some of y'all. That's due to degraded soil. So Houston, we have a problem. Kind of go back to that, a bunch of us were watching this when this occurred, and that's happening global wide right now with our soil health, and a lot of people believe that's what's causing a lot of human health issues. It was because it all goes back to the soil. So this is her land, Trace and I are from Branson, Missouri area. Many of y'all probably been to Branson or heard about it. It's a big tourist town, but if you've been there, you know there's no ag. And I silly decided, boy, I'm gonna grow some corn and soybeans. I'm a wildlife biologist, do some research for some plant companies. And this is what I started with. This is a profile of the soil. And you can kind of see here, this was a view out of our house. It was an old degraded cattle farm. It, would, it was so degraded that it's hard for me to say, but in my career, I've never worked another property with as many cattle skeletons. They'd starve to death. The rancher, before we purchased, had just so overgrazed and abused it, even cattle were dying. So that's what people would call topsoil above that white line. It's really not soil, it's just rock, right? But I was all inside a gung-ho, and I said, we're gonna plant soybeans in these rocks, and you know how it is. Maybe in your career, you've had experience like this. That won't work. That's silly. You know, got laughed at, called names. And I'm a big reader. I know y'all are probably readers too. And of course, everyone knows the Lewis and Clark Journal and their observations about what was happening on our continent on the, in the U.S. before settlement in the western part. This is a book by a guy looking for lead deposits where I live, actually walked, you know, not that many miles from our place. And he took notes like Lewis and Clark. And what I found there were these explorers like this everywhere across America. And you can read these and learn how to plant communities and animal communities, what, what was there, where you live, or maybe where you are, and how they interact with each other. This is a great one. I've met some people from Iowa, 
and this was a young Iowa guy. This is a fabulous read if you want to learn about some of this stuff. That was the first known uh, Caucasian buffalo hunter in Kansas. He loaded up an old buckboard wagon, literally like you might see in an old western, went to Kansas. He was a great writer, and his journal is fascinating, how he interacted with Native Americans and the bison and what he saw and plant communities he saw. It is fascinating. I mean, you know, hiding in hollow trees from Native Americans. This was a firsthand account, and his family published his journal. And then I worked in Yellowstone a little bit, uh, as a naturalist teaching high school teachers about wildlife. Uh, great, great couple summers there. And I'll tell you a funny, uh, I have a wicked wit unless I control it. And this, I was just a junior guy and the senior naturalist was, you know, uh, wasn't necessarily concerned about following the truth, but maybe uh, painting humans as bad. And, you know, we got humans are the only thing wrong with the planet, which is not true at all. And, uh, and these are bison, of course, crossing the river. And he would, when we'd get a new group of teachers in, he would say, you know, we've just restored wolves and now the park is totally natural. We have all the main predators. We have wolverine and bobcat and mountain lion and you know, on and on, coyotes, and, and now we have wolves. And I couldn't help myself, so I'd raise my hand. Finally, he'd have to call me. I'd say, sir, you know, the sign at the south gate of the Yellowstone National Park said there was 30,000 Native Americans living in the Yellowstone Park area. There were humans that hunted for survival. And there's no hunting in our national parks. And in most areas, our national parks in horrible shape. And you ride around, oh, this is great, this is great. It's in horrible shape because they're over-browsed. And most of the native plant communities have, have been depredated on by too many critters and they're not there anymore. And we've let these animals overpopulate. And we see that in diseases like brucellosis and Yellowstone and other diseases. We can restore these things to a better habitat. So in my reading, of all these books and working with other really good farmers, hands-on practitioners and scientists, myself and others, primarily others, have come up with this set of what we call rules or guidelines for healthy soil. It was always covered with vegetation year round. Even under four feet of snow, there'd be those basal rosettes coming up out of the soil that stored energy in the root system, carbohydrates from photosynthesizing in the previous year to get a head start. You, know, you see those little green things if you live in a snow belt sticking out first. Uh, forage grew as many days out of year as possible. There was a wide diversity of plants on our land, state botanists, some NGO, non-government associations, uh, conservation associations, and myself have identified over 176 species of native grasses and forbs. That's rainforest diversity. That's rainforest diversity. Plants and roots tilled the soil. There's no tillage, right? The mold board plow had not been invented yet. We hadn't had a dust bowl yet because there was no exposed soil. If we don't expose the soil, there's no erosion. And ruminants impacted the soil. That's an interesting we get to. So now this is typical ag, smaller scale. Because if I put the big modern ag equipment uh, picture that, on here today, it probably would fill the screen, right? But you notice even just a little wind erosion with just that little bit. And we think, boy, this is fluffing up the soil and that little seed's gonna germinate and put its roots down and grow. But actually, if you, you know physics, and you, know, you guys know physics way better than I do, when you've got something going forward in a heavy weight, i.e. the disc behind it that's wanting to go down, gravity's always working, those eighth inch blades are actually making a layer of compaction. You fluff up you know, the top five or six inches or whatever, and then you're compacting the soil. So roots hit that and grow horizontally and they can't reach all the nutrients in one foot, two foot, three foot, six feet deep plains. Moisture can't go down or up. And by the way, you're killing microbes and uh, very beneficial insects by the untold numbers. Did you know, by the way, that earthworms aren't native to North America? They were brought over here. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. There's a few things that works out good when we move it where it wasn't put originally by a creator, right? Earthworms, no one's mad at earthworms, right? Pheasants, no one's mad at pheasants. But I bet some of y'all where some of y'all live, you're mad at maybe bush honeysuckle or cerisa lespediza or kudzoot or some plant that's really a booger. And usually it was brought in here from another continent. So this soil, and my good friend Ray Archuleta, a very, very talented soil scientist, he calls this naked, dead, cold or hot, depending on the time of year, and compacted. Because right below that disc plane, it's really compacted. 
So this is really interesting, and this is even worse now. You know it's 206, because I was, to be honest, a little too lazy to update it from NASA's website for this presentation. But watch this, and that red, well that's carbon in the atmosphere. And what's really important is just look down here at your bottom left, this is January 1, we're gonna go through a year in about a minute. And watch the cycles here, and I'll just, if you allow me, narrate through this. So here we go, we're gonna rock through here. And you know, we're getting on through January, and you see some red, especially up by the poles, flowing around. You can tell where North America, South America, Africa is. Getting a little more, right? A little bit more intense, because a few people in the southern parts are getting in the fields and turning soil. They're releasing carbon, more than industry. This is, you know, a lot of people in the fields right now. Wherever you live, you're seeing tractors in the field in April or so, right? May, man, they're planting like crazy. But what happens? Seeds now in the soil and it's growing. And it's photosynthesizing. Remember your seventh grade biology? C6, H12O6. Plants are the greatest thing in the world to take carbon out of the air. I don't want to offend anyone, but they're way better than electric cars. Plants are taking carbon out of the air like crazy. And we're going through, I mean, look at this. So we've cleaned up the planet almost. And then what happens? We start harvesting crops. And there's a little lag time here, right? And then we got bare soil. How many of y'all drove by a bare field on the way to the airport or something getting here? It wasn't, yeah, I see a bunch, yeah, yeah. Carbon is just going up in the atmosphere like crazy. Now here's an interesting thing. We talk about, you know, greenhouse gases. I'm, I'm not that guy, really. I'm a simple wildlife biologist and all that bad stuff. You know, your body's about 70% carbon. A deer's about 70% carbon. A whale's about 70% carbon. Microbes, bacteria, about 70% carbon. When carbon's up in the air, it's not helping critters living down here. So when we're always covered, well, we, we got a lot of life going on. We're photosynthesizing. It's not too hot or not too cold. It's aerated because those roots are going down. Now here's a real sadness again. It's almost like a Nat Geo type thing. Most of the species of dung beetles are almost extinct or extinct in North America. Dung beetles would take all the bison, elk, you know, deer, whatever, human feces, and, and bury it about 14 inches deep. They'd make a hole about the size of your pinky or a pencil, which was just perfect to aerate the soil the right amount and allow water to infiltrate. There was no ponding, really. Pondings were water staying on top of soil. But all the tillage and, and insecticides and stuff wiped out most species of dung beetles, or maybe a few living in a fence row or something like that, literally. And so we don't get that perfect aeration. And when we disc or turn soil over, we allow too much air to contact those microbes and that literally terminates the beneficial microbes and encourages the bad microbes. And there's all these compounding factors. So how can we solve some of this stuff? Here's some more really more recent research. Uh, great scientist, uh, Alan Westcote, David Montgomery doing some fabulous work. And you can't read this, I'm sure, but the blue is regenerative ag or where they don't till the soil, they don't use uh, you know, synthetic, which are mainly made out of petroleum products, fertilizer, they're not using pesticides. And the red is conventional ag. Conventional is a relatively new term, right? We've been plowing for 50, 60 years, stuff like that, been using these products. And in every test, the blue tested out way better, way, way better. SOM, by the way, is soil organic matter. That's the secret to the whole bus, man, because that organic matter feeds the microbes, and the microbes do some really cool stuff we'll talk about in just a second. So the soil was covered year round. Now, how can you do that in a farming application? That's a pretty tough one, right? We've got to harvest crops, we've got to plant crops. How can we not bear the soil? Well, there are ways, and we practice this on our farm. This is on our farm. Uh, this is called planting green. About 5% of farmers' production, you know, commercial production farmers across the United States are doing this now. This is a no-till drill, if you're not familiar, and it's got a little disc on it. The Bedouins have just a single disc. And it's slicing through the standing vegetation, almost like combing hair, although I'm not very good at that. And slicing through the roots, which are about 70% of the plants. Plants are like an iceberg. Usually about 70% of the matter by weight is below ground. They're slicing through there and putting that seed or seeds at exactly the right depth. But it never exposed the soil. And then to terminate this without using a herbicide, we have a crimper. Now I talked about bison earlier. And I used to call this the buffalo system because I think it really makes sense. And if I could get my crimper, I'll explain this in a minute, to urinate, defecate, and salivate as it's growing across the field, man, I'd really be getting somewhere. It'd be really natural. But you notice it's got these fins, and they're about eight inches apart, 
And, and it's not too heavy, about 1,000 pounds spread across eight feet, this model. So that's not that much pressure, but it's enough pressure to, you know, putting pressure here and pressure here and pressure here on a plant stem. And that's, of course, crushing the circulatory system, and it terminates the plant. If you mow your yard and you crush or cut off the circulatory system on a perennial grass, what happens? It grows back. But on a lot of crops or annuals, the majority of crops are annuals, and if we crush that circulatory system, when it's making a seed head, you can see some seed heads on this really tall cereal rye, and if you look down here, you see a whole bunch of different species, and it's just crushing that as we go. And this is how it happens, it's just this simple. I'm not using any herbicide. Now there's a lot more going on here, that's putting about a four to five inch mat of vegetation across my field. Just like maybe you mulch a garden or you mulch a flower bed. Weeds aren't coming up through there. Weed seeds are real small. You've probably never seen a ragweed seed or a mare's tail seed. They're really small. One, one mare's tail may make 100,000, 200,000 seeds. A soybean or corn doesn't make 100,000 seeds per plant. If they did, we'd solve world hunger really quickly, right? Those seeds are really small. So they get moist and warm at the right time of year and they germinate but they exhaust all their energy in the endosperm before they get through four inches of mulch, make two leaves so they can photosynthesize. But a big seed, and big relative to those seeds, could be a clover seed or a turnip seed if you ever planted those, pretty small, certainly a corn or a bean or a pea or anything like that. It's got so much energy, it will go right up through that mulch because it's not as tight as pine bark or some mulch you might put in your flower bed, photosynthesize, and it's off to the races without the competition of weeds. The second thing is, this is the world's best, I mean, that, like, that's a big statement, right? The world's best slow-release, time-to-release fertilizer. Now, if we had a bell of straw set up here on the stage, and you know the HVAC system controlled, there wasn't hardly any moisture in the air, I should sit here for years and almost not decompose, right? Too dry for microbes to really break it down. Or you had one in your living room or something like that. But if you set it up here and, you know, once a week you put a half inch of moisture on there, it'd start breaking down. The more moisture you put on, the faster it'd break down. The less moisture you put on there, it wouldn't break down. Well, if we're not getting rain, plants start growing, they don't need fertilizer. If it rains a little, they need a little bit more fertilizer and just decomposes a little bit more. If it rains a lot and that plant can really grow, this breaks down much quicker. It is the world's best. No irrigation system can be timed like this process. It's the world's best. It's our weed control and our fertilizer because those plants have a lot of nutrients in them. We just harvested part in the seed head. It took nutrients to build those cells and cell walls and the roots are staying in place. And all those pores from the roots that are decomposing from the past crop or earthworms, well, they're staying in place. So when it rains, water infiltrates in. This is really good research also from the NRCS again. If you don't, I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm so sorry. NRCS is National Conservation Resource Service. It's a government agency, it's very large, under the Department of Ag, and they do a lot of good research. They, this group does a lot of good work to help American farmers and landowners. And if you can't read it, the green goes up to about 80 some odd degrees, and the yellow goes up to about 112, and then the red up to 140. And it's a soil temperature thing. Boy, I can't imagine soil 140 degrees. That's cooking, right? You ever put your hand on a black pickup when it's about 80 degrees outside and sunny? Soil's dark, or it should be, right? And by the way, what makes soil dark is carbon. If you've ever had powdered carbon, it's black. When you drive by these fields on your way home that are really light colored, that's not natural. The carbon's up in the air. That's been tilled a whole bunch over time. That's not natural. This is my field. I get skin cancer like I see some tape on my ear because you know, of the meds I take for my transplant. So I've got a big old floppy hat and long sleeves on. My doc would be proud of this slide. And I, I'm taking with an infrared gun the temperature above the mulch. So it's kind of light colored. It's probably reflecting a lot of heat. And you can't read it, but that temperature is 103. It's 80 degrees a day, 87, I think it was. And that's 103 degrees on top of the mulch. Yeah, about right, sun shining on it. And then I, I take the mulch away, and really quickly before anything can change, you know, I got my gun, I'm pointing, I caught a gun, a thermometer, pointing right at it. 87 degrees, right in that prime growing zone that the NRCS had, because I'm reflecting some of the sun's energy back up. Now, if there was a leaf there, 
it would be photosynthesizing and capturing that. But without a leaf there, where the tractor turn, you know, turning tractor, I'm not a good operator, and I turned it too sharp, and I pushed some of the mulch away, and I bared the soil. You can tell that seed, that's a yellow seed, a soybean seed in my hand. It doesn't look too good from y'all, right? I mean, it just doesn't look too good. Well, that was 131 degrees. This was all, by the way, in about two feet of each other. So when you diss that field, you put these little fragile, you know, think of the term here, the center of the seed that makes it work is endosperm. A seed is like an embryo. And you put it in a really harsh environment and say, hey, grow and make me a great crop. And by the way, take a lot of nutrients out of soil while you're at it, but I've disc and created a hard pan, so you only got six inches to get the nutrients from. We set ourselves up where we have to add a lot of synthetic inputs. Now, I'm sure in your profession, you may look back at a few things that were done and say, boy, why did those guys do that? Well, they didn't know any better. Those girls didn't know any better, right? Well, when we started getting fertilizer and doing stuff, literally, I mean, it's literally, folks, it seems unimaginable. Of course, universities, land-grant universities would be doing this testing, and they would, you know, do it in greenhouses, in pots, and they wanted to make sure, you know, I had too many stat classes myself. Everything's equal, right? We've got to have a control and everything's perfectly equal. So they would fumigate the soil and kill all the microbes on purpose. And that way they could tell if they get a response from 5-pound equivalent per acre of nitrogen or 10-pound or 20-pound or phosphorus or potassium or boron or whatever. Which sounded so good, it's, it may sound good to you. It sounded good to me when I was in school. That's what I was taught. Got to fumigate that soil, get it all level. And that kept us from learning the important role of microbes. So here's in a real field, you see the mulch layer, and it's obviously decomposed some. You're seeing a few gaps in there because it's been decomposing by insects and microbes or bacteria. You see a few insect holes in some leaves, but not much. But it's still protecting because raindrops fall at about 30 miles per hour. And they're also compact in soil, but when you hit this mulch, it's like hitting a little spongy springboard, and then it slowly infiltrates into the soil and goes down in the holes of those earthworms, other insects, and where roots had decayed. So my really good friend, Keith Burns, who's taught me a lot, very wise, wise farmer, uh, Keith says, and he got this term, I'll give credit where it's due, from an orange grove farmer in California that now does Virginia Vag in his orange groves. It's not how much rain we get, it's how much we keep because the rest of it just runs off. Doesn't matter if it rained three inches, right? You've been in a bad storm, maybe looked at your driveway and it's running down the driveway or the road or you know, whatever. So this is a field and there's different species out here, the white flowers or buckwheat, which is a great pollinator plant if you keep bees. Buckwheat's a great plant, grows anywhere. Craig's had some on his land. Forage grows me days throughout the year as possible. How do we get that or out of year? Well, it's obviously cold, right? And there's some deer out there eating. But look at, check this out. It's cold. This is at our land again. It's cold. I don't remember the temperature that day. You can see where deer are pawing through the snow because remember, plants will store carbohydrates in their root system and try to push up through there. You can see that snow on that deer's nose where it's been out there trying to make a living. These deer are pretty rotund, right? They, they got a little fat on them. They're not looking good. By the way, the little deer stuff, I'm really a deer biologist. Deer can erect their hair, make their hair stand up. In the winter, a deer's hair will be three or four inches long, and that traps heat. It's like the best down coat ever made, man. So they look bigger because they're erecting, they're standing all that hair up and trapping air next to their body, which they're not losing heat. When deer bed in the snow, they rarely melt the snow. They're just not losing much body heat. If I bed in the snow, and I'm cold, I'm not going to bed in the snow, right? And I would certainly melt the snow. So I like a blend of species. The real tall stuff is cereal rye. It's more cold hardy. It's a small grain like wheat and oats, but it's much more cold hardy. It will grow once it's developed like this at about 28 degrees. It will germinate at 32 degrees. As long as the ground's not so frozen, it can't pop through, it'll germinate. Now, I've got some clovers. That's crimson clover you see down there and some other stuff. Ideally, I've got stuff stacked so no sunshine is reaching the soil. I don't want to dry it out. I don't want to kill the microbes by getting that temperature too high. And I want to capture all the sun's energy because the key to all of life is photosynthesis, C6H1206. I like to ask people, again, that wicked wit of mine, what'd you have for breakfast? You know, eggs, bacon, whatever. And so, no, you really had the product of photosynthesis, whatever you ate. If you ate a beefsteak for breakfast, that's the product of photosynthesis. That's how important capturing sun is. 
Summertime crops, I've got milo, sunflower, buckwheat, peas, beans, uh, some, and some brassicas. I don't want any sun get to the soil. How can a farmer do that? There's diversity of species all the time. A lot of farmers now, this is so cool. And it almost sounds heretic to some people. Some farmers are planting on 60 inch rows, five feet apart. And they always plant north and south. Anyone got an idea, yell it out. Anyone got an idea what that would be? I mean, I'm used to talking really interactive crowds. So, you know, unless you're throwing tomatoes, I'm fine for yell it out. 60 inch rows, always north and south. Because it was learned that the limiting factor for corn production was photosynthesis. And you got a 10 foot tall corn plant out there, some new hybrids are, but all the bottom leaves aren't getting any sun because you plant 15 inches every 20 inches. They're not photosynthesizing. But when you plant 60 inches wide, north and south, sun comes up at the east, it's hitting these lateral leaves on a five foot row most of the day, you know, gets to the apex, hitting both sides. Sun gets in the western side, sitting all the leaves over here. You stack the same population of corn in. You plant it, the corn stalks are almost touching, but the leaves are photosynthesizing more because they're getting sun all day long. This doesn't work if you plant east-west. <laughs> People have tried that and the yield goes way down. And then in the middle, you can plant another thing like beans, peas, or diversity crops to feed nitrogen to the corn. These farmers aren't paying for any nitrogen. That's one of the most expensive things of growing corn. Well, they plant a legume, a plant that interacts with microbes and makes free nitrogen. The air we breathe is, is about 70% nitrogen. We breathe in and out NO3. That should ring a bell with some of y'all, because that's super toxic. We would be dead in seconds if we could breathe NO3. If I was talking to anesthesiologists, they'd say, nah, yeah, man, I got that one. We can't break it down, but plants and microbes break that down. They kick one off and make NO2, and they can use that. They can use that. So we're planting legumes here that are converting nitrogen to a form the corn can take. And the newest combines can sort out corn and beans on the fly. They're, har they're planting varieties that mature about the same time and they're harvesting corn and beans at the same time with less synthetic input so they're improving their soil and laughing all the way to the bank. This is a really sad thing. Our agriculture's got out of tilter. 85% of farmers in North America are broke tomorrow without government subsidies. That's a fact, that's not just a figure, that's a fact. 87% only survive because of tax dollars. That's wrong. Farming should be a very desirable, you should know this too, that farming has the highest rate of suicide in America. They're broke, they're on loans. We can turn this around, we can save rural America and make healthier food too. So I plant blends, farmers can plant blends that cover crop, you know, after they harvest the summer crop or they grew wheat and they plant a blend then in the summer. This works either way. Plant roots till the soil. You don't have to have mechanized tillage. You don't have to use the diesel fuel or stuff like that. I think, and you all fix stuff. So I think this is a cool fix. Uh, uh, Ohio has a great ag research at the land grant university in Ohio and they have discovered that when tractors or combines or whatever are running over a field with a cover crop well those tires are basically running on a thin layer of water right leaves are full of water and they get better mileage they burn less gallons of diesel per hour than running over bare ground where it's been sprayed like crazy and it's just bare soil because there's more friction of the tire running over that bare soil than there's running over plant leaves there's just so many benefits. So different size roots till the soil in different ways. You get a lot of tillage going on here. And this is what really good soil should look like. Really good soil should look like, you're going to get hungry here, rich chocolate cake. No, I heard that. All right, that was an audible. Uh, it's got pores in there. It's got a lot of pores that hold water. Because these microbes, they don't walk, they swim. They swim on a film of water. So you think about, I'm going to back up here on purpose this time, these roots, pretty limited surface contact, right? The only nutrients or water they could get by themselves are not much. But the real player that I haven't talked about yet is mycorrhizal fungi. Fungi. In that little area of this little root right up here could be over a mile of fungi hyphae. Literally. I, I don't know the researcher that measured that. That, would, that was, had to be a graduate student doing that one. Yeah. 
And all that goes in the plant root. So now that mile in a relatively small area has access to all the nutrients and moisture in that area. And here's the economy going on. There's a true economy that goes back to the early research where we fumigated all the soil. The microbes, can't, they don't want sun, right? Disking kills them. They don't want sun. All critters are about 70% carbon. They've got to have carbon, but they can't photosynthesize. So they literally go in a healthy environment, in and out of plants, and say, man, I'll give you whatever you want for carbon. You need some boron. You need some nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You need, oh, there's a predator. On, this is so cool. There's a predator on the other side of the field, and that plant is emitting a pheromone, an external hormone. And I need you to stay alive so you can give me carbon. So I'm going to give you a pesticide to keep that aphid from attacking me. That's why the best farmers are no longer using any form of insecticide. Because the microbes are doing that for them. It sounds sci-fi. It sounds sci I know. This sounds sci-fi. But about 5% of U.S. farmers are doing this and smiling and happy and laughing all the way to the bank. And their grain or their beef is testing so much higher in nutrient quality than anything else on the general market. Or deer we eat. Because I'm a hunter at heart. So here's really healthy soil. And those pores are from decaying roots or earthworms or macro species, not, you know, not microbes like protozoa, macro species. It looks good. Earthworms typically come up at night. And there's earthworm species that go up and down. Kind of a boring vertical life, right? There's earthworm species that do this, and there's earthworm species that do this. So when you put it all together, that soil is the perfect chocolate cake. Earthworms are really cool animals. And, and, you know, on your right over here, that's killing a lot of earthworms and at minimum collapsing their dens. They make little nests, if you will, to lay their eggs in. That's, that's all destroyed. This is not on your left. This is like the buffalo going across the Great Prairie, knocking seeds off as they trample by, which in effect was planting the seed. So here's a graphic illustration. There's, you know, P and K, phosphorus, potassium, a little nitrogen soil, most of the nitrogen air. Above each acre, here's the disc, and it does. Boy, it fluffs up the top, but it actually causes compaction below. And that top, you've seen this, it just shrinks down. You've seen it where it's crusted over in the field, if you go out in the fields. It's crusted over, okay? And now the roots can't penetrate that hard pan. It's called a hard pan. And they hit that, and oftentimes they would literally turn sideways. We call that a J-root. And it's really easy to diagnose. Go out in the field. If you're in the ag area or you, you farm or your family farms, go out in the field, pull up a crop or pull up, you know, two or three bean or corn. Or corn's hard to pull up. Pull up some little simpering corn and see if you see these J-roots because they now have no access to all those nutrients. And the earthworms aren't going through the hard pan. The other insects aren't going through the hard pan. It's a relatively easy fix. And then the farmers say, I want a chisel plow to break that hard pan. A lot of farmers chisel plow about every three or four years. I see a couple of heads nodding. Yeah, maybe your family or someone chisel plows. Um, that's just making your hard pan deeper. But plant roots have hydrostatic pressure. You've seen this when you've driven through rocky areas. You see a cedar tree or something growing right out of a rock bluff. And you go, oh my gosh, how's that do that, man? That's so cool. Hydrostatic pressure is extremely strong. And as slow as a plant grows, there's plenty of time for that root to start chipping through that rock. So here's a J root. You know what you're looking for when you pull one up. This was on my land, unfortunately. And ponding's a big issue across America. Ponding not only is wasted water because it evaporates instead of going in soil, but it's going to run off excess nitrogen or other synthetic chemicals, and it goes in our root system. Has anyone in the room, show a hand, please. Anyone heard of hypoxy zone? One guy. You, you check me, you know, my oil here if I'm telling you the truth or not. There's about 10,000 miles, am I doing okay so far? All right. In the Gulf Coast where there's no life. There are no fish. Fishermen don't go there. Literally, you can Google this tonight, check my oil. That's all the nitrogen running out, of the, you know, the Ohio River and the Mississippi River and the Missouri River. Those big rivers go through the, the bulk of our ag in America. And all that excess nitrogen running off it's going down there, and where the Mississippi River pours into the Gulf Coast, it's a dead zone. And you can see it from satellite images. The water looks different. Fishmen don't go there. It's a dead zone. And, of course, we have erosion. 
You may find this interesting. The state of Iowa loses about five tons of soil per acre per year. I really lost some of y'all on that. The thickness of a piece of typing paper over an acre is a ton of soil. Rock, dirt's heavy. It doesn't take much for five pieces of typing paper. A couple of ditches like this, six inches deep. Well, that could be five tons per acre. Our most vac- we got to eat, right? And we eat. There's not enough hydroponics to feed the world. That old, old movie for y'all my age, Soy and Green, <laughs> that's not working, right? we got to grow our food or harvest our food. So we have little ditches like this. You can see the dirt running over here in the grass. See how the dirt washed off that? That's the farmer's most valuable resource. His most valuable resource is soil. So earthworms talk a little bit about just 25 earthworms per square foot. That's not a lot if you're digging around. is enough to totally fertilize the field. But if you go to Stuff Mart, wherever your local store is you like to go at, and you buy worm droppings called vermiculture, it's extremely expensive. I love earthworms. They work 24-7, 365. All I pay them is decaying vegetation from crimping on top of the soil. That's the only pay I give them. And they fertilize, they, they, you know, they aerate, and they're slimy. I'm sure you've held or dissected an earthworm. And when they're sliming through the soil, they're carrying these microbes as they go. They're distributing the microbes all through the soil. Ruminants. Where do we get ruminants? Well, this is, this is some of my graduate work, you know, graduate students. I'm on the other side of the desk now, but yeah. We take white-tailed deer rumens. By the way, a rumen, you know, a cow, anything that ruminates has a rumen. They don't have four stomachs. They have one stomach with four chambers. Each chamber has a different family or millions of families of microbes in there, and they digest stuff. And this deer had been eating some pine needles. It was very hungry, and some of them fed it corn and some wood chips. We go through and identify exactly what they're eating, then look at the nutrient content of that. And because they have to break this down, that leads to a lot of... Uh, they salivate a lot. Deer are much smaller than a cow, right? Uh, salivate about two gallons a day. Uh, a cow, a, a, an average, you know, 800,000 pound cow will salivate 20 to 30 gallons a day. If you ever raise cattle, you know how much you have to water them. They're putting microbes with every step. They're adding these beneficial microbes, sorry for the crude slide, <laughs> back out on the soil. They're just constantly replenishing them, and as long as we don't disc, those populations are building up. This is so cool. It's taken by a farmer friend of mine in Oklahoma. had like a $17 Amazon super cheap thing that you put on your phone and, you know, a little endoscope type thing, and he puts it down a wormhole to see what he'd see. You got labs spending millions and millions of dollars, and you got a farmer who's a brilliant guy, wears overalls every day of his life, takes this, you know, $7.99 red light special on Amazon, sticks it down a hole and gets, as far as we know, the world's best picture of a plant leaking carbon exudates. Those are little root hairs off a plant. All plants, again, trade carbon, or they want to trade carbon, to microbes so the microbes can bring to them what they need. That's the economy that was created. And if you want to learn more about that, this is the best webinar, seminar. I've attended this seminar, but I found it on the web too. Share, just take a picture of that, write it down. About 45 minutes, and it is so, from a scientific point of view, this is so interesting. Carbonomics. It's, it explains much better than how I've explained this economy going on, blow our soil. We should know that blow almost every acre of soil, maybe not blow this concrete floor, there are more microbes than the weight of two adult elephants. So, beautiful habitat, whether it's a cornfield, a bean field, a wildlife field, it's not that hard. We need to let the soil do what it needs to do. We need to follow some basic principles of science. We need to be constructive and not destructive in our practices. And those natural systems will more than provide. And I'm not talking y'all go, you know, go, go slay, slay some food for your family tomorrow. We can put this in agriculture and provide more than enough food for the next 50 years. And do it in a healthy way because you don't have to eat as many oranges to get the right amount of vitamin C. You don't have to eat as many pounds of beef to get the iron you really need. These are much healthier. This has been shown in eggs and salmon and all these different things that the healthier the critter is, the more nutrient packed it is. Plants too. So I started with this. 
And that's a very, very productive area now. And this can happen, and, and I always say, well, I hear a lot, Grant, you know, and that's your specialty, and it works where you are, but it doesn't work where I do. And another name for you in this is uh, Alan Savory. Dr. Alan Savory's even older than I am and done world-renowned work on this, primarily in Africa, helping feed the nations in Africa. And where they thought they had too many critters, he's now doing what's called adaptive grazing. You know, here get 200 head of cattle to feed the villages and put them literally cheek to cheek. And they're just going through like the great herds of wildlife used to and they urinate, defecate, salivate and trample and they're not brought back to that acre for a year. And it regenerates. In the meantime, the village plants their crops or whatever. And it's working. I mean, it, is, it should be the headline on every news station out there. It's working. It's working beautifully for almost no financial input. They already had the cattle, but they were grazing them all over instead of herding them like herd animals, which is how our environment was made to respond to. So this process, in the agro, it's called regenerative ag. In the wildlife world, we call it the release process. And it works everywhere. I mean, literally two inches of soil, Canada, there's farmers in Canada doing this. It saves time and money. There's fewer trips, less diesel fuel, less wear and tear on the implements going across the field. Got to remember that above every acre we are, no matter where you are, either pole in the middle of the earthquake, equator, there's about 35 tons of nitrogen above every acre. Why would any farmer ever pay for nitrogen? Why would you pay for nitrogen for your yard? Well, you have to because you're out there putting fungicide and every other side out there trying to keep the yard looking beautiful, right? Heaven forbid, I see this guy smiling over here. Heaven forbid, you know, we got a dandelion in our yard. You ever try to pull up a dandelion? The root, it always breaks off, right? You know what that dandelion's doing? It's reaching really deep because it's got a really strong tap root to bring nutrients up to the plants around it. That's why you have dandelions because your yard is starving, literally. You balance your yard, dandelions will not be an issue. I know. Uh, I'm sure Scott fertilizer and you know weed aside hates people say that. It's the best way that scientists know so far to improve our soils, improve what we eat, and improve human health. Because a lot of diseases are now thought to come from a poor diet. And for years we thought a poor diet was you're like me and you drink too many Mountain Dews or eat too much ice cream. But poor diet can be as simple as the broccoli you're eating or the ribeye you're eating is not as nutritious as it was in the scale of time a really, really short time ago. Farmers have been asked that are really successful at this, why don't more farmers adapt this? And the reason is really simple. People are scared to try new things. We know this is true. We know this is true. I've seen farmers that would only try this on the 40, on the very back of their farm where they thought no neighbor would see it. Because it looks kind of odd. I've got stuff growing between my corn rows. They might think that's weeds. I'd be ostracized in the neighborhood. I only plant north and south? My GPS on my John Deere doesn't get to do north and south. It circles the field to be efficient. It works. It works well with crops we depend on. This is wheat coming up under a crop of beans because we can spray that on right before we harvest with a drone and not have the weight of that tractor after crushing all the beneficial microbes. It works really well. Thank you for letting me come speak to you. I hope this is something that maybe touched a bell with you all somewhere. If you want to ask any questions, if we have time, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.